Hello everyone and welcome to Jojolian Chapter 85 Review and Discussion, and also if you're watching this the day it's uploaded, then happy Jojo Friday! We had a hell of a Golden Wind episode this week, we're nearly concluding the Dopio and Metallica fight, which has just been so good so far, and if you guys didn't know, I do a weekly Golden Wind podcast on SoundCloud that you guys can check out in the description, where you guys can listen to all my thoughts on every single Golden Wind episode so far. I have guests on stuff too, so that's the plug. And also, I was gonna wear a Metallica shirt because it's like Metallica fight, Jojo Friday, but I couldn't find one. I swear I have like five of them though. Um, so instead we're wearing an Operation Ivy t-shirt, really old punk band. Um, they actually only had one record, but if you haven't heard of Operation Ivy, go listen to them, they're great. But anyways, on to this month's chapter, Jojolian 85. Chapter title is the head doctor of the TG University Hospital, part two. Although we don't really see a whole lot of the doctor this chapter, and we kind of do nearing the end of it, but you can see from the cover page, let's just, just get right into it. So from the cover page, you see Jobin, who we haven't seen in quite a long time. Or I guess, we, I guess we've seen him here and there, um, but he really hasn't had like a pivotal role in the part since way back in Poor Tom, which when I think about it, eh, it was like three arcs ago because we had what? We had uh, Wu Tomiki, you know, the whole, the, once we got to the hospital. And then right, yeah, right before that was poor Tom. So I guess Jobin has been relevant, but um, the Wu Tomaki arc went on for what felt like a year. So uh, we get more with uh, what's, what's going on with Jobin and we get some narration that says what he seeks is strength. And I don't know how I feel about this whole sequence with Jobin that we get in this chapter. Um, I guess I'll talk about it when we get there. But to start off, uh, we see Mitsuba, who is uh, just at the Higashikata home. She's by herself, which at first I thought was strange. Usually the Higashikata home is always full of life. You have Joshu doing Joshu stuff, Hato and Daya messing around, Norisuke sitting on the couch or at the table or something. The house is usually full of life and it has like a good vibe around it. But right now it looks like just completely empty void of all life if i had to get like you know like the iraqi trend the narrations that he puts over the over the chapter titles and stuff there is no one in this home but uh so Mitsuba's just here by herself walking around and we don't know what day this is uh so in the current arc right now or just like this part of jojolian it's we're working towards the harvest of the new fruit last chapter the countdown was really prevalent and it gives us sort of an idea of what time period we're in and what days the characters are fighting so especially last chapter we were flipping around i think between like there was an unknown time and then we went back in time and forward in time so it's getting it's getting a little hard to follow um because right now we don't know what day this is on uh when mitsuba is at the house with jobin so maybe we'll find out later and maybe this will be important later once we get to like maybe four or five or three days into the harvest or something but to continue on jobin sort of catches mitsuba off guard and we do know that this is obviously after she was at the hospital because she has her rock nose and jobin's like hey mitsuba did you not think i would notice like you got plastic surgery on your nose and at first i was like okay jobin's not stupid he might be stupid but he, okay so he's not stupid at least i don't think he is and he's very aware of like the rock disease and rock humans as well because he knows rock humans he's like friends with a lot of them he was friends with poor tom or at least a work associate, and he knew a lot of the people with the drug trade, and he was working with them, so he sees Mitsuba, and he sees she has a rock nose, so I don't know if he's just pretending here, or he just wants to let Mitsuba think that he doesn't really know what's going on when he does, when he's sort of like uh, working towards a greater goal right now, who's in possession of the new Rokakaka branch, and is like the one I would like seed to harvest it, like he's the number one seed right now, and all the characters trying to harvest this fruit. He's the, he's the one that's probably going to do it unless anything uh, crazy happens and someone gets their hands on the branch until we get the, to the end of the harvest. But So he sees Mitsuba and he says like, oh, you got plastic surgery, you look so cute. And also, Mitsuba has like this inner monologue like, shit, Jobin found out. He knows that I withdrew 200 million yen. I believe we're probably going by yen here because this is all Japanese. Um, but 200 million yen is like nearly $2 million. I think it's like conversion rate. What is it? Quick maths, quick maths. 100 yen to like what is it like 90 cents or something so it's like 1 million 700 thousand something crazy like that so mitsuba's been going really hard at the at the hospital getting all sorts of work done to her spending all the higashi got a family's money i guess her money kind of because they're married but um the, we, we see like this interesting side to jobin's personality so like so far jobin's been like kind of a sinister character although like i can't take jobin serious at all so like usually when we see him like when we were first introduced to him like way earlier in the part um when they're at like the fruit parlor like he seemed like really serious and you know especially during like the blue hawaii arc when he attacked yasuo like jobin's sort of working up to be more of an antagonist type character with a really serious personality working towards his his various goals that he has and it's cool to see that when 
when he's with like his significant other, his partner Mitsuba, we see like a more goofy side to his personality, which is like super realistic. Like a lot of people that you meet, they probably act totally different around their significant other. At least I, I know I do. I'm pretty serious in videos and stuff, but I'm like, a, I'm a dipshit when I'm around my girlfriend. But uh, so we see this side of Jobin's personality and he like, he like picks her up and he's like, oh, you look so cute. You know, let's go fuck. Like, let me bring you into the bedroom. He picks her up, sweeps her off her feet, rushes into his bedroom. And we see like the, the funniest little things in this, uh, this little sequence here. So the first thing is that he says uh, that nose, it's so cool and sexy. It's kind of like my pet Hercules, or it's kind of like my pet uh, Hercules beetle, but even better. Implying that Jobin thinks his beetles are cute are cool and sexy, but Mitsuba's just a little bit better. And so he rushes her into the bed and we see Jobin's room, which I don't think we, well, I guess we saw maybe once, maybe that's where Beetle Tennessee took place. I think that's happened where Josuke and Jobin like fought with the Beatles. I think that was in Jobin's room. Cause yeah, he had like the whole beetle cabinet. So we see that he takes her onto the bed. And at first I thought that the bed had like beetles on it. Like Jobin's a freak for beetles. He has beetles in his room and his bed sheets even have beetles on it. But no, this is just like a loose beetle that's walking around his room, walking around the bed while they're like about to have sex. And um, yeah, Jobin's just a complete man child. Back to what I said earlier about how like, how I can never take Jobin serious. And people are like, Jobin's like, he really seems like he could be like a main antagonist for part eight. It's like, I think Jobin, can play a villainous role as he kind of has been playing lately in the part but it's like i could if jobin was the main villain which i don't think he is like not at all i just i couldn't take him serious at all because like jobin is a complete man child like like a lot of the other members of the gashikata family too like uh joshu and even like the girls like dai and hato like they're all sort of adults that are still children like none of them have really had like a hardship in their life except for the first child um because you know we had that flashback with jobin that showed that he got bullied a lot in school so jobin has like the most i don't know not really abuse but like the most bad things that have happened to him throughout his life because he had the whole thing with him and Kato, the mother. And of course their mother did go to jail, but for the most part, like their life has been like smooth sailing. Like they all live like for free in this huge mansion. They all have their own rooms, uh, except for Joshua. Remember when Josuke moved in, Joshua got moved like above the garage and Josuke stole his room. Um, so Joshua's not doing so hot actually, but like, like I said, for the most part, they're all sort of just like coasting through life. They don't really work. I know most of the, most of the older ones go to college, but I mean, they have all the money in the world. And uh, yeah, like Jobin, for example, he's married and he's letting his wife spend like actual millions of dollars converted to USD. And it's like, he's just, he lives at home still. You see his bedroom here. So Jobin's a man child and I can't take him serious as an antagonist, at, at least for now. But to continue on making some progress with the chapter, um, when they're in bed together, and, and also remember how I mentioned earlier how it was weird how the house was like empty? I thought like maybe depending on what day this took place in, maybe the other members of the family are out fighting or something, but it just turns out they're in like the middle of the day. It's like 3 p.m. So everyone's out, all the older kids are at school. Surgi's doing whatever Surgi does, probably still at school actually, or in his bunker, and everyone else is out. So no one's home, they're home alone, and that's why the house was empty. And Mitsuba begins to mention Surugi, and she's like, Surugi, when they, when they say Surugi should be home soon, and then uh, Mitsuba's like, yeah, Surugi, Surugi's been kind of weird lately. He had this thing at school, and then, you know, he had like this instant, and Jobin knows about it as well, because Jobin's like, you know, he says, he mentions later about the crushed gates, so Mitsuba's already like filled Jobin in on this, I guess, or Jobin knows somehow, and also... I for, I for, I'm forgetting to mention so many things. This is the first time we've seen Jobin and Mitsuba like really interact in the entire part. Like I always wondered like what it would be like when Jobin met like Mitsuba for the first time that we see and they're actually like talking to each other. And it's like, it's not really what I expected because Jobin immediately tries to have sex with her because he thinks her nose is like so cute, which like, which was kind of funny. But yeah, it's cool to see Mitsuba and Jobin actually have an interaction and they, they talk about their child and they talk and Mitsuba at first, she was really defensive about like Surugi being accused of the things he was accused for, um, you know, like attacking that child and also pushing the other kid into the, uh, the pond. Do you remember that? It was way back when Surugi was getting like bullied or something and he made one of the kids like step on something using paper moon cane and he like fell into the water. So Surugi was also accused of doing that. And then he had the violent incident and Mitsuba was always like really on the side of Surugi didn't do anything wrong. But now we get Mitsuba sort of reflect and she's like, huh? Well, that kid was bullying Surugi about like his grandmother being like a, a child killer. And then she's sort of like, huh, maybe Surugi did do these things. And then we get Jobin 
which I talked about earlier about like, I don't know how I feel about Jobin in this chapter. He goes off on like more monologuing and it's kind of hard to pinpoint what exactly Jobin wants to do in the part. So we know right now he, he wants to get the, he wants to harvest the new Rokakaka. So he can use it for really whatever he wants. He can use it in a drug trade if he wants to, like he was before with all the other people. He could sell it. He could make a lot of money. He could grow strong. And he could also use it to save Sarugi in a sense so no one would have to sacrifice themselves to save him. Which is kind of weird because, like, we don't know how the new Rokakaka works. Which is really... I, this is the one thing that's bothered me in, like, all Jojolian. Like, everyone thinks the new Rokakaka is, like, so powerful. And we kind of got a breakdown of it that was, like, it replaces bad cells with good cells. So for example, if Surugi was to eat the new Rokakaka, um, what that would allow, it would like sort of give him the ability to replace the cells that are dying with newer cells. And it's like, wouldn't that still require a sacrifice? Because when jo Joseph Ume and Kira mixed, first of all, the conditions were so specific, them being underground for like three days together, like pushed under pressure. And that was like the exact requirements that made them fuse together and then become like, create have two dying people make one healthy person so it's like it, it'd be really annoying if once the new rokaka cause harvest it turns into like a magical fruit that just does like anything sort of like not really a requiem arrow but i don't know just sort of like a plot device that's just sort of like this new rokaka is so special because it can exchange cells and now we're going to use it to do like literally whatever we want so i hope nothing like that happens once it's harvest and it doesn't become just a big plot device that can really do anything like paisley park by the way um uh, but anyway so what, what jobin's monologuing on here about is like apparently uh jobin is like a he's a huge darwinist i know i didn't uh, i didn't pick jobin for someone to be like so into darwinism he's he talks about how like you know people think that these are coincidences when things happen to them say like they arrive somewhere late or early and something good would happen to them or something bad would happen to them it's kind of weird the way he explained it but what he's trying to say here is that like good and bad luck don't exist illegal and illegal is irrelevant and even good and evil doesn't even matter like there there is no such thing as good and evil there is only the strong and the weak and it's just it's darwinism 101 he's like the strong survive and the weak are destroyed and i guess this is jobin's new look on life like jobin we've seen into his character a few times like back in the blue hawaii arc i believe we saw that like his ideals were rising from zero, which I guess still aligns with this whole Darwinism idea of, you know, he wants to be strong to survive and all the weak will be destroyed. So I guess that makes sense. But at first, Jobin was like, when you're born, regardless if you're born poor or born wealthy, where you're born is your starting point and that is zero. And your goal should be to rise from that and become stronger to a sense. And then later, this might have been during the uh, Urban Gorilla arc, maybe we saw a flashback where Josuke, where Jobin was at a baseball game and we got more look into like what he wanted to do. And like his main goal then, or like what I suspect would still be his goal now is that he wants to take over the Higashigata fruit parlor at some point, And then he wants to like, just exploit the revenue from it. So right now the Higashigata fruit parlor is known for using like really high quality fruit and like providing the best quality possible for like the best price. And what Jobin wanted to do was like reduce the quality of the ingredients by like half so get cheaper quality ingredients and sell it for the same price so he would make a bigger profit and that was sort of his goal for an idea he just wanted to like grow the business and be successful and now he wants to become strong and destroy all who are weak and i don't know jobin's just like an enigma right now i really don't know what he wants to do and he has different ideals like every time he goes off on like a big monologue thing so uh who knows? Who knows what's going on with Jobin? One thing he does say is that, like, if anyone tries to step foot on the Higashikata family or anyone tries to, like, test the Higashikata family, they will be destroyed. Maybe foreshadowing that, uh, you know, if jo if Josuke or Mamazuku or, like, our main cast tries to interfere with him, there may be a fight against Jobin, which I still think there will. Like, Jobin has been built up, although I don't really view him as an antagonist. He's been built up to have this villainous role. It just wouldn't make sense for him not to fight Josuke or not to fight anyone in our main cast throughout Auto Jojolian because... He's going to have a conflict at some point. It's inevitable. He has the branch. He has the thing that everyone wants, and he's not going to give it up for free. So unless something happens that I'm not foreseeing, I don't see there being a future of Jojolian where Jobin doesn't have a fight with our main cast, which is exciting to think about. And this is sort of like building that up even more. And then we get into the sort of the closing parts of the first half of the chapter, and we see 
Mitsuba look off into the distance when they're in the bedroom and she sees the head doctor outside of the grounds, like way off uh, the Higashikata estate, sort of by the coastline. And she sees him standing there. And she's like, that's the head doctor, the same person I saw in the videotape uh, from Surugi's school. And I have things to talk about this, but we'll come back to it later because we'll see more of the head doctor later in the chapter. So really weird. The head doctor is just outside of the Higashikata home, just looking out into the water, I guess. Weird, but we'll talk about it later. And then when Mitsuba goes over to the window to try to open it, she like kind of pricks her finger and starts bleeding. And then she goes back to Jobin and is like, hey, can I have a Band-Aid? And she sees the new Rokakaka branch. And she knows what it is because when she was in the hospital, she saw the whole lab, oh, excuse me, that had like all the branches. So she knows what it is. And she knows that Yasuo is looking for the new branch. So like she puts two and two together. She doesn't say anything, but she's like, oh shit. The branch that everyone's searching for, it's in possession of my husband, Jobin. And uh, yeah, wait, right at that like big reveal where it's like, they sort of have like an exchange because it's almost like Jobin knows that she saw it. And then Jobin might be putting two and two together as well. Like, oh, she has the rock nose. Maybe she had an experience with the Rokakaka as well. So she knows that I have the new one. So this could be building some tension between the two because like the last shot we see of the two, there is like a weird staring exchange between them. But that's the end of the beginning part of the chapter with uh mitsuba and jobin i kind of talked a lot about it to make it feel like there was a lot of substance there but honestly it was a pretty lackluster beginning of the chapter and there really wasn't anything too crazy going on except for maybe that we saw the head doctor that could have some implications later and the fact that mitsuba now knows that josuke has the new rokakaka so i talked way too much about the beginning part but that that was the beginning part of the chapter but now we can get into the second half which is uh picking up where we left off on chapter 84 last chapter last time we saw josuke and mamazuku so we jump right back into our chase for the head doctor and things immediately get suspicious and it's clear that at least one standability is being used here but from what we see from the head doctor later in the chapter the way he's moving around it really makes me think that we see two stands being used in the chapter one being the head doctor's stand that is influencing his movement and how he's able to escape so easily from the main cast and the second stand being toro's which i'm still 99 percent sure that the stand we saw last chapter with the arm blades that one was toro's um and toro is sort of like stalling the main cast and letting the head doctor get away which has like so many implications like okay this would mean toro definitely is like a bad guy and he's working with the head doctor and the head doctor is like in control of all the rock humans so what does that mean for toro is toro a rock human we get a whole lot of questions this chapter and not a whole lot of answers but hopefully they will come later in the part um so the first suspicious thing we see is when josuke reaches out to like grab the head doctor it we just cut to there being a glass wall in between them which it's hard to tell what actually happened here because the pages before we didn't see a whole lot of the environments around us so it could be possible that like the doors were closing and as Josuke reached out, the doors just like closed. Like they're like electric moving doors or something. But from what we see in the head doctor, what we see the head doctor do this chapter, like it definitely looks like he's like skipping around, which is a bad word. I probably shouldn't use skipping because the part five anime is going on right now. And people are like immediately going to jump to the conclusion that like, oh, he maybe he stands like King Crimson. Maybe he can skip through time, skip through time and space or something. So uh, he's definitely doing something. He's doing something this chapter, which is a word Araki uses a lot. He said it last chapter where it's like, the stand definitely did something. And then like five other times in this chapter, it's like, something happened. The stand did something. Something is attacking us. So the stand definitely did something, but I don't know what exactly it did. And I don't even want to try to guess because like, also later in the chapter, uh, I have so many worries and questions about this head doctor. But before we get there, um, we see right after the head doctor escapes because there was like this glass door that shut, uh, Yasuo opens it up with Paisley Park and they continue after the head doctor. And then out of nowhere, like five chairs just come together and stop them and they like run into Mamazuku, which at first I was like, dude, what is Sea Moon in the part now? Are we like affecting gravity where all these things come together and attack our main cast? Like, again, I didn't, we didn't see enough of the environment and the chairs just seemed to come out of like nowhere. So... We didn't see the chairs move beforehand. It was just snap. In one cut, the chairs are in front of them attacking them. So I assume they moved by themselves and or they just appeared there or something. But yeah, the cast is now stopped by the chairs, which uh, again comes back to my theory that Toru and the main doctor are working together. The head doctor is skipping away, I guess, teleporting. He's doing something. And then Toru is blocking the characters and stalling them so they can't get to him like as fast as otherwise. And then we get some dialogue from Mamazuku, which is like, it makes me think that okay originally i didn't think the head doctor was going to be a main villain or at least even be a candidate for main villain because he's just he's been introduced too late in the part and i don't know like 
he just seemed to come out of nowhere. And I know we don't know the full, we don't even know who he is, really. He's, he's assumed to go by an alias that's not his real name. We don't even know if his age is real. So it just feels like chapter 85 is just way too late to introduce your main villain and then have us just like fight them immediately after. So um, it's just unlike any other part of JoJo. And like every other part, we at least know who the villain is from like the halfway point, And then we'll maybe get some interactions with them and maybe even a fight with them before like the final fight, like with King Crimson and in part seven, Funny Valentine is there like the whole time. And again, in part six, Poochie is in the part throughout the whole time. So for part seven to have its main villain introduced this late into the part, and then we immediately get in a fight with him. Uh, I don't know, it just seems strange, which didn't make me think that he could be a main villain, but this dialogue from Mamazuku is very convincing. He says, like, the head doctor. He says he is the mastermind that was controlling poor Tom, Wu Tomaki, and uh, Urban Gorilla, and he also says that this guy was probably in control of the whole drug trade and everything as well, so now Mamazuku is telling us that this head doctor was the person that was in control of everything from the beginning, way back from the first rock human we ever fought being... Yotsuyu, I'm a rocks user. Uh, this guy has been in control the whole time, but we never even knew anything about him. He was never alluded to. Like maybe way back in like chapter 60 or something when Mamazuku said like the enemies are scientists and doctors, but like we, unless this guy's identity is revealed and he's someone that we saw later in the part, maybe he was the guy in Josuke's flashback. <laughs> like maybe some shit like that. It's just, I don't know, man. This guy to be introduced so late just doesn't. It just doesn't feel like what we've seen in other parts of JoJo, which isn't necessarily bad, but it just seems weird. I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you guys think it's too late to introduce a main villain? And also, like, I originally thought Kato was going to be the main villain. And if this guy's main villain, like, what the hell is... What was the point of introducing Kato? What's Kato been up to the whole time? Why do we still not know her Stan's name? Why was it introduced and then never seen again? Uh, like I said, this chapter introduces a lot of questions, and it heavily implies that this head doctor is like fulfilling the role of a main villain because he is the mastermind behind all of the enemies we've fought so far. But Jojolene is just weird, man. I don't know what to think of it. I, I honestly think it's like different from many other parts. Like, I don't even know if Jojolene will have like one solid main villain because there's like so many other characters. Like Jobin's doing his own thing. Now we have the head doctor and who knows what the hell Kato is up to if she's even going to be relevant for the rest of the part, which I still think she's going to because her stand was introduced, but it never got a name. Like, is Kato Stan just never going to get a name throughout the entire part of Jojolian? She still has her own motive of wanting to take down Norisuke, so we're late into the part. So many questions, so many people that could be main villain, and uh, right now it looks like the head doctor is, like, sort of fulfilling that role. But it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right that a character introduced this late takes up the role of main villain. I don't know what to think of it. So to continue on from some main villain discussion, we see more of uh, the stands being used and some dialogue between the people, between our main cast. So you see that Josuke notices Toru and he's like, Toru was over there, we saw him. And then Yasuo was like, don't worry, don't worry about Toru, like he's nothing. And she's, she's like, don't worry Josuke, I don't have feelings for Toru anymore, that's in the past. All I'm focused on now is getting that new branch. And then we see this is giving me flashbacks to the funny Valentine D4C introduction arc, which we just did a video. My last video was the whole most confusing stand in JoJo where like D4C was teleporting funny Valentine around and it was just really confusing, which thank you guys so much for supporting that video. That video went like crazy viral for me, uh, at least like through my standards. So thank you guys so much for supporting that and sharing that video around. I really appreciate you guys watching that one. Um, but like I'm getting like horror flashbacks to that, like things are confused and happening and it looks like the head doctor is like teleporting around because we see Mamazuku in one panel run towards the head doctor, he runs towards him. And then in the next panel, he's running away from him. The head doctor is going out the front door and Mamazuku is running towards Josuke, which is like, please tell me this is not another funny Valentine teleporting situation where like just things are getting really confusing in one location. I don't want to do another video like that again. Um, so you see him walking out the entrance and then out of nowhere, Josuke is like, Mamazuku, why are you running towards us? The head doctor is behind you. And then a, uh, what it was, a, a uh, an umbrella rack like or like a coat rack falls on Mamazuku, which is again just out of nowhere, which I assume again is Toru's stand. And then they see the head doctor leave. And they also check the security camera and it's like the security camera footage like isn't matching up, I guess. Like we saw Mamazuku over here, but it's like you see Mamazuku walk past the head doctor. And they're like, Mamazuku, why did you do that? Like why did you walk past him? And Mamazuku's like, Are you calling me dumb? I don't know what's happening right now. Stop blaming me for shit. And uh so like oh 
a lot of things going on. I don't even want to begin to theorize what the stand abilities could be. I sort of have an idea of what Tauros could be, or at least the stand that's making the objects hit Mamazuku. I have an idea for what that stand ability could be, but the main... I want, I want to say main villain. The head doctor stand is like, it seems so like abstract to the point where it could be a main villain stand too. Like something that's like manipulating time and space in a way, which aligns with, uh, you know, a lot of the villains in the in JoJo. Um, originally, like the parts like three through six, the whole theme was time. But then in part seven was the first one that like broke that theme where it's like funny Valentine and D4C, they don't necessarily mess with time, but they like alter reality. And they like, like, you know, the whole dimensions and everything. So like, maybe that's going to be the theme for the next group of, uh, or like the alternate universe villains. Maybe their whole theme is to mess with reality in some way, but I, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to think about another confusing stand right now. I'm all confused out from that last video, but, uh, so far it seems like this guy is messing with people's perceptions and he's skipping around or teleporting. He's doing something that's going to be fucking confusing. I'm calling it now, whatever this guy's ability is revealed as later, it's going to be super convoluted or it's going to be really simple. And I just don't see it right now, but continuing on after that sort of confusing sequence of Mamazuku walking away from the doctor, uh, Yasuo gets a phone call and she says like, ignore it. I don't care. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm only focused on the branch right now. And Josuke sees that it's from Toro. So he doesn't, I think he, maybe he rejects it, but he waits for it to go to voicemail. And then, you know, again, Yasuo was like, I don't care. But Josuke is like, huh, I'm kind of curious about this. So he listens to the voicemail and what it is, is Toro confessing his love for Yasuo. He's like, Yasuo, I want to go back to the way things were, um, you know, when you helped me save that child, when uh, last chapter, when they ran into each other, which is another important thing, like Toru ran into Mamazuku with a, a, a stretcher, whatever it is that you carry someone on. And then him and Yasuo had that moment where it's like they saved a child together. And before I mentioned that, like this could be Toru sort of like manipulating Yasuo to make them think that like sort of they have some chemistry still. And he confesses his love to her and she's like, and, and Toro's like, I've always loved you. I regret, you know, dumping you. I guess Toro dumped her. He's like, I regret leaving you every single day and I want things to go back to the way they were. And he sends a picture of them on like a beach together. And he's like, meet me here to the spot where we like, you know, you know our favorite spot when we were dating. And like, now that it, now that it's sort of, at least to me, I see that without a doubt, Toro is working with the head doctor and they're colluding in some way. This is just more manipulation to Toro. I don't know if he really cares about Yasuo, but it seems like he's definitely manipulating her in some way. And I don't know what his intent is going to be later, if he wants to kill her or if he really does still like her, but he's involved with the rock humans and he's involved with the head doctor in some way. So again, more questions, not a lot of answers. So I won't go into it too deep, but I think that I think that Toro is still manipulating Yasuo in some way. And now we get on to the final pages of the chapter and Mamazuku starts to realize that things are things are really weird right now and nothing is making sense because as they were walking, he said, I bumped into the stretcher with Toro and then I bumped into a bunch of chairs and then I bumped into an ele uh, I bumped into an umbrella rack. Like what is happening? Things have been knocking into me. And then the next page, we see some of that Jojolian body horror of Mamazuku's legs being essentially torn off of him. Like they're just like, you know, I don't know how to describe it really. They're just kind of, well, you guys can see it. They're just like torn off him in a way that reminds me like, it looks like they were cut in some way, which again makes me think that the stand that's making these objects run into uh, Mama Zuku is Tauros. Cause we saw it had the arm blades and it looks like his legs were like split. So the way I think Tauros stand works is maybe like, maybe it, it, it works with gravity. It can, and it, he can influence objects to move in some way. So he was making them run into Mamazuku. And once like you come in contact with an object that's been influenced by a stand, maybe it does like damage over time or it does slicing damage that you wouldn't, you know, really notice. So it's like mundane inanimate objects that you run into, you know, they don't, it doesn't feel like it hurt, but over time, maybe they do more damage. And like, it's those arm blades coming into effect where like, it, it appears that like the arm blade sliced his legs. So that's kind of what I got from this. That's kind of, I don't know if you guys have any other idea on what that could be, but like, I'm pretty sure that all the things that they've been bumping into is a result of Toru stand. And yeah, I guess it does damage over time or maybe it can turn those objects into blades or just have like the property of blades or something, but don't appear as blades. 
I don't really know what's going on. I, I'm just making shit up at this point. But okay, so all right, we see more of Mamazuku's body horror, and it's like Mamazuku has been like a giant punching bag for the entire part of Jojo Land. Like every fight Mamazuku's in, he gets destroyed in some way. And I love in this panel how you can also see he's still missing his his four fingers. So like in the Urban Gorilla fight, he got permanent damage done, and then also in the fight against uh, Wu Tomaki, he had permanent damage done. And now, wait, what happened to him in the... No, 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 he wasn't in the Wutomaki fight. It was his fight against Urban Gorilla, and then his fight against poor Tom and Ozone Baby. How he got, like, completely destroyed. He turned into, like, actual spaghetti uh, with his uh, doggy style. So it's like, yeah, he didn't fight Wutomaki, he fought poor Tom. And, uh, yeah, Mamazuku is just always, you know, getting mutilated in some way in, like, every fight he's in, which makes me feel bad for him, because he doesn't even want to be here, and he's always getting, like, the, he's always getting destroyed, but uh, that's where the chapter ends right there, and again, we see that something is coming, so we don't really know what's going on, but something is going on, and that is where the chapter ends, so... Uh, for the seventh time, so many questions, not a lot of answers. I think I said pretty much everything of what I thought about the, uh the stand abilities being used right now. That was probably a really piss poor explanation of what I think Taurus stand does, but I don't know. I guess damage over time. Like he can bump into you with something and then that causes more damage than you would think. I don't know. I'm sure later in the part, we'll get the full explanation of the stand. But right now, um, it just seems weird. It just seems weird. And I don't really know how... I don't really know what I think about this part so far. Or like, not the whole part of Jojolian, but this part of the chapter. Because like, I feel like... Things were just happening without any knowledge of it. What am I trying to say right now? It's like, we didn't see enough of the environment to have like any illusion to like, uh, or any suggestion that things were moving. Things just kind of popped out of nowhere. Like the doctor just skipping, things are just running into our main cast. And it's like, we didn't have enough context to why these things were happening. And uh, I don't know how I feel about it, but for the most part, I, I did really like this chapter. A lot of action and uh, definitely a few stand abilities being used. This has to be too. The head doctor had to have been teleporting in some way or doing something. And I want to mention earlier, um, when we saw the head doctor outside of the Gashigata home, when he was like way off by the coast, it's like the head doctor, there's so many thoughts I have about him. He wants to use the Higashigata family in some way. I think his main target might be Surugi, and he wants to manipulate Surugi in some way. Because we also saw the head doctor at Surugi's school. So, like, again, maybe comes into the idea that this guy can, like, teleport around or some way, and he, or he manipulates space and time. Because, like, although these were all at separate locations, but he's, just, he's moving around a lot, especially for an 89-year-old man. So he's in, although these are happening in separate days, I assume. He's in the hospital, then he's at Surugi's school, then he's outside of the Gashikata home. Like, I don't know, this guy's up to something and I don't even want to begin to think about what his stand could be. So uh, my head hurts already. Anyways, guys, let me know what you guys think of Joe Jolian chapter 85 in the comments down below. Like tons of things to speculate. I could do like a four hour speculation video on this, but there's no point to because just we'll get answers in time. All this will be explained in time, hopefully. So no point to try to, you know, explain it all right now. But um, I'm definitely interested. I'm interested to see what's going on with this head doctor. And uh, yeah. A lot of questions. A lot of questions. So thank you guys so much for watching Jojolian chapter 85 review and discussion. If you guys enjoyed, uh, please click like. What? Do I ever say that? Like the video if you enjoyed. Subscribe for more. And uh, I'll talk to you guys later. All right. Peace. Thank you guys for watching.